Okay, chapter 10. Let's talk about rivers and streams and, and floods. So, starting off with this, uh, we need to understand a little bit about the hydrologic cycle, uh, which is just the movement of water uh, from the sea onto the land. This is something you probably saw starting in third or fourth grade, uh, but these are kind of the main uh, culprits of it. Uh, you have evaporation. Where's my little... There. There we go. You have uh, evaporation, which is just the water evaporating off the uh, off the ocean or off the, the lakes and rivers uh, on land. It condenses into clouds, and it'll move around, and then rain as precipitation was rain or snow. You also have transpiration, which is just evaporation from plants. Right, plants take up water at their roots; they stick it up under their leaves, and the water can escape through those leaves. Uh, runoff is water flowing over the land surface. So when we ever talk about runoff, which we will a little bit more uh, in the next chapter, uh, we're talking about the water that's staying on the land. We're talking about the water that's getting into the rivers and staying on the surface. Infiltration is where you get water that soaks into the ground, and we're more talking about groundwater, which is what the next chapter is all about. So there it is, evaporation, condenses in the clouds, moves up onto land, precipitates, it runs off into streams, uh, or it infiltrates into uh, the ground. And going back to this, we're going to see a lot of big, bold words in this chapter. Uh, I will emphasize in the module exactly, exactly which ones I really want you to focus on for the test. So don't go watching through this and necessarily write all these things down. Uh, I'll go ahead and do that for you in the module. Uh, in fact, you should have already seen them before you watch this video. So, something uh, important. There's not that much water on planet Earth. And there's certainly not that much usable water. So here we have the Earth. If we took all the water on the Earth and put it into a sphere, so all the fresh water, all the salt water, and we just grouped it together into a sphere, this is about how big it would be. Pretty small, right? If we think about this, this kind of makes sense. Uh, we've got a planet that's thousands of miles across. However, the deepest oceans are only a few miles deep. It's not very deep at all. I mean, relative to us, it seems deep, but relative to the diameter of the planet, it's not that deep. So there's really not that much water uh, on planet Earth. It just looks like it, and it's covering a whole lot of the surface. Fresh water there's even less of. And a lot of this fresh water is locked up in ice and glaciers on Antarctica. The fresh water we can actually get at and drink is that big. It's very little. This is why we care so much about fresh water and water resources and why we put so much of our tax money into it. Uh, it's a very significant resource. Uh, and as the global population continues to grow, uh, Places can run out of water, and when we have things like climate change, and we have droughts that prevail, 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 uh, you can actually lose out on water resources. Uh, in fact, we have an issue in this country where a lot of our farming happens right here in the middle of the country. Uh, however, the, the groundwater that's there uh, is running out, uh, and it's, it's, there's some concern, and we'll talk about that in the next chapter. So like I said, uh, water is a concern. And if you pay attention to the news at all, it's hard to miss that there's been a conflict in Syria uh, over the last 10 years or so. Um, and there is a big argument that the conflict really started or was heavily exacerbated by a major, major drought. They ran out of water. People that were in the rural areas and that were farming got hurt really economically. And then they moved into the cities and they conflicted with the people in the cities. And before you know it, you've got a big old civil war. So water is important. So let's get into what this chapter is mainly about, and that's running water, uh, which are streams uh, or rivers. I'll kind of use the words interchangeably, uh, but a stream and a river, same thing. It's just a body of, body, of water run, body of running water confined to a channel that runs downhill under the influence of gravity. A stream is what you think it is. A river is what you think it is. But there's different parts. Of a stream or river. There's the headwaters, which is the stuff at the very top. It's the very back end of the river. There's the mouth, 
where it ends and enters a sea or lake, there's the channel, which is the narrow region that it usually sticks in. Uh, and then there's the banks, which are the sides of the channel. There's the stream bed, which is the bottom of the channel. As a geologist, we talk a lot about the stuff that's on the stream bed because that's where all the sediment is. Then there's the floodplain, which is the stuff that is the, the area that's outside the channel. So whenever there's a flood, a stream will overturn its or will get out of its channel and flood into the uh, floodplain, kind of like we see in this satellite image, this infrared image down here. So there it is blown up. Uh, when we have, when we're closer to the back of the valley or the mouth of the, or sorry, the uh, headwaters of the stream, uh, you'll get more of a V-shaped valley. And as the stream matures and you get closer to sea level, uh, it starts to what's called meander. And then we also see the channel be occupied with a floodplain. So it gets much flatter. So you can kind of see these are cross sections right here. So that's kind of what that looks like. And this is another little cross section right here. So stream is in its channel, stream is flooded, and it's now out here in the floodplains and it's occupying these areas. We'll talk about this uh, towards the end of that, uh, this little lecture. Drainage basins. So drainage basin is the area drained by a stream and its tributaries. So it's all the land area that flows into a single uh, river. A tributary, it's the small stream that flows into a bigger one. So you can imagine the Mississippi River is a big river. It's got a whole bunch of tributaries. The Arkansas River is a tributary to the Mississippi River. The White River is a tributary to the Mississippi River. The Illinois River which is kind of in western Arkansas, uh, flows kind of to the southwest and hits the Arkansas River. So it's a, the, the Illinois River is a tributary to the Arkansas River. A divide uh, is the land masses or the ridges, I should say, should say, the high points that will divide drainage basins. So what am I talking about? Well, let's blow up this image. So we have a stream that's here, and it's got a bunch of little tributaries, but here's the main stream, and it has a divide, a drainage divide. It, this divide is dividing it from this other stream. So this is the drainage divide, and this is the drainage basin. The whole thing is the drainage basin for this one stream, and then this one over here has its own drainage basin uh, as well. And if these two meet up farther down here, then we could say, and it forms a bigger stream, and we'd say, oh, this stream's drainage basin includes all of this. There's something called the Continental Divide, which is like a super divide, which separates streams that flow uh, into the Pacific, into the, into the West, and those that flow mostly into the Mississippi River. Uh, and it's this kind of really high point, uh, kind of in the Western US, you can imagine it's mostly uh, along the Rocky Mountains, uh, and you can kind of drive up to it. And this is what the Continental Divide is. So Tom, sometimes you might hear about this in history class, and it's kind of a significant thing. But everything west of it kind of flows west in the Pacific, and everything east flows east, uh, mostly into somewhere into the, uh, the Atlantic, or in this case, up here into the Arctic. So here's the drainage basin for the Mississippi River. So there's all these other rivers that dump into the Mississippi River. They're all tributaries of the Mississippi River, but this is the big old drainage basin of the Mississippi River. So kind of crazy that you can go way up here in, in northwestern Montana, you can find a little stream, and it will dump all the way out here into the end of the Mississippi River. But you can go over here in eastern Louisiana and find a spot, and it doesn't actually go out the Mississippi River. It'll actually go out another river over, probably over here. Kind of crazy. And this is that continental divide. A little closer to home. Uh, this is the White River. So if you're into fishing, you probably know all about the White River. There's some really, really, really kind of world-class rainbow trout uh, fishing up here. I've never done it. I've been meaning to. But it's on the back end of the dam for Beaver Lake. This is kind of Beaver Lake, not the greatest lake map in the world. but. Uh, this is the White River. It starts here in southeast Madison County. And again, here's Arkansas. This is Benton County. 
up here in the northwest, and we're about right here somewhere. So we're not quite, our, the school is not quite in the drainage basin for the White River, uh, but it's close. But there it is, all this little light yellow area, that's all the drainage basin. So all the streams and smaller rivers in here all move down and eventually dump into the White River, which eventually dumps down here into the Mississippi and out into the Gulf of Mexico. Here's that uh, a different type of map, but again, showing the same thing, a drainage basin for the Illinois River, which kind of starts over here where near where my house is uh, in Prairie Grove. Uh, here's Benton County. So again, class is up here somewhere. Or school is up here. But again, here's the drainage basin for the Illinois, and it dumps out in the Arkansas River. There's a lot of environmental concern with this uh, because it provides drinking water, uh, it provides agricultural water, but there's a lot of agriculture that happens in these areas. This is a, quite a, a fairly flat area compared to other areas to the east. Uh, so there's a lot more farming that goes on. So there's a long history of, of the Illinois River watershed and trying to keep it uh, environmentally healthy. Speaking of divides, uh, if you've ever driven south to Fort Smith, you'll have driven through this tunnel. If you've never driven south to Fort Smith, you will go through this tunnel, and it's one of the biggest tunnels anywhere uh, in in the region. I, in fact, to go through a bigger tunnel, you might have to go all the way to the Rockies or all the way to the uh, to the Appalachians. But this is a big divide where everything uh, this tunnel goes through the divide basically right here at the top. And as you go through this north to Fayetteville. You're mostly driving downhill, but if you turn around and go back this way to Fort Smith, you're also driving downhill. So this is kind of the highest spot on I-49. Um, but they had to punch through this this last bit uh, of the divide. So everything here kind of flows south into Arkansas, but everything on the other side of this flows north, mostly to the White River. So hopefully you'll never look at this tunnel the same way again. Now you know something. There are different drainage patterns that are kind of moving along here uh, that rivers can make. There's dendritic, radial, rectangular, and trellis. And these are kind of the little different shapes that the rivers will, will follow, and they're dictated by the geology. So let's just go forward to this. Uh, dendritic, dendritic is a another word for kind of tree-like. If you ever heard of dendritic, kind of is talking about tree-shaped, but dendritic drainage is what we have up here in northwest Arkansas. Our rivers and streams all kind of form uh, in tree-like shapes, and, and this is pretty common throughout throughout the country. Uh, these other shapes, like the rectangular pattern, this, this is kind of rare. You don't see it as much. Radial patterns tend to happen when you have really big singular mountains, like a volcano, so you'll find this in areas like the, uh, the uh, um, northwest up in Washington and, and Oregon. You also have a trellis pattern. The trellis pattern you'll actually find down in the Awashita's, not too far south of us. Uh, that's because the Awashita's were kind of squished up. So imagine, uh, we'll talk about it more when we get to structural geology, but imagine taking a, uh, a rug and squishing two ends of it, and you get a bunch of folds in it. This is what happened in the Awashita's. And if you remember when we talked about weathering and erosion, we had differential weathering in the rocks. So some rocks weather easier than others. So it's much easier to weather a shale than a sandstone. Uh, and because of that, you'll end up getting these valleys where they're easier to weather out and erode out uh, versus the, the peaks, versus the mountains. And you'll end up getting this trellis pattern. And we can see that in the Ouachita's. And I encourage you to go pull up a map of Google Earth or, or wherever else and see if you can actually spot these uh, patterns in, in the maps. Uh, as far as what I want you to know, I want you to know the trellis pattern, and I want you to know the dendritic pattern. I'm probably going to ask you a test question, or maybe a quiz question. Velocity. So water velocity. So water moves, right? Uh, rivers both deposit and erode uh, the area around them. So they're, they, they do both things. In fact, they do both things uh, all the time where they're at. Um, so let's talk about it. So where is the velocity? Where's the maximum velocity in a river? Well, it's not always right smack dab 
uh, in the center, tends to be near the center, but as a river meanders, uh, that higher velocity can be on the right or the left, depending on where you are uh, in the meander. And if you get far that velocity far enough to the side, you will erode over here, but the velocity is super slow over here, so you'll actually deposit over here, and vice versa up here, so you'll get deposition over here, but erosion over here. Uh, if you have a flood, floods will increase your velocity and it'll increase erosion. However, floods, during floods, you can also do some deposition if you overturn the banks and dump a whole bunch of kind of silt and lighter sediments uh, onto your floodplain. So kind of, kind of do both. Uh, a gradient, a stream's gradient is the slope. So think back, think back to, uh, to your algebra and, and, uh, what, sixth grade? And think about slope, y equals mx plus b, all that stuff, right? So streams have an overall slope. The higher the slope, the higher the velocity, which, and the higher the velocity, the more erosion you're gonna be doing. However, if you have a lesser slope, you're gonna have less velocity and you're gonna be doing less eroding and more deposition. Another term is discharge, which is the volume of water uh, passing through a point in a stream. So it's how discharge is how much water is moving down the stream. So I can say, go out to a, a stream somewhere and I can say, oh, there's this many gallons going by in a second. You know, there's a hundred gallons going by in a second. That would be kind of a, a decent sized stream. So I wanted to blow this up and kind of show how in a river we can get erosion and deposition kind of at the same time. So you have this meandering river. As it goes around the bend, it's speeding up on the outside. So you're getting erosion over here. So you're increasing that bend, you're eroding over here, but the water slows down enough over here that any sediment that's in it uh, will deposit on sandbars. But when you come back here to this meander, you have faster water on the outside. So you're eroding over here this time and you're depositing uh, over here. Uh, we can kind of science this and, and, and graph it uh, for, for general streams and for grain sizes. So remember back to sedimentary rocks, we have clay, silt, sand, and gravel. These are the different sizes of sediment grains. Um, and we also have the velocity of a stream. So, so how much, how fast is it going? So now if we take a grain of, say, sand that's this size, we would say, oh, if the velocity is this slow down here, it's going to be depositing. But if you increase that velocity, eventually, oh, you're going to start transporting it now. So it's moving along in the stream. But if you get it even faster to this point, so you're now up here at the stream with a really heavy velocity. It's moving really fast. It's not just bouncing along and being transported. It's scouring out the channel uh, of that stream. It's doing some eroding. And likewise, we could go over here to a piece of gravel. It takes a lot of velocity to get, get a heavy piece of gravel going, but man, once you get it going, uh, it's gonna start beating things up. Take a moment to look at this. This is a famous river here in Arkansas. It's not just famous here in Arkansas. This, is, this river is known around the world. Uh, I used to live in Hawaii and in Alaska and people uh, river rats, people who spent a lot of times on rivers and did a lot of canoeing and kayaking, they knew what the buffalo was when I mentioned I'm from Arkansas. Uh, they, they'd ask me about this. And, oh, wow, that's, I've heard that's great things. Or, oh, yeah, when I learned how to kayak, I learned on the buffalo. It's a great place. So uh, famous river here in Arkansas. It's a couple hour drive to the east of us. But this is uh, the Buffalo River as it meanders around and it it's eroding on this side and causing this bluff to kind of fall apart over time. But it's depositing on this side, so it's deposited all this sand and gravel uh, on this side over time, and it's grown out over time, and then the other side is eroded out. So in the future, you know, several thousand years, million years in the future, uh, actually it's just, yeah, on the order of thousands, this is actually gonna be way over here, and then this will continue to grow. So, how does stream erosion work? Uh, for one, it picks up the sediment and it just beats it along. We've talked about this in sedimentary rocks. There's also uh, erosion by solution. 
which means you're dissolving rocks. So if a stream is going through limestone country, uh, you can actually dissolve that limestone just like we dissolve the limestone when we put acid onto it. But mostly, most common, and I think what we care most about being here in the Ozarks is abrasion. Uh, I shouldn't say that. There's a lot of limestone around here in the Ozarks, and so this does happen. Uh, but abrasion uh, is a big part of what's, how streams erode, and again, it's it's the sediment being carried along and getting up to a high enough velocity uh, to where you're you're eroding out your channel. So let's talk about the uh, transportation of sediment. Uh, there's these different terms to kind of characterize it. There's the bed load, which is the stuff on the bottom. So there's the bed load, sand and gravel. It's just bouncing along on the bottom. It's abrading. Uh, and so it's either sliding, it's rolling, or it's moving around by saltation, which means it's bouncing around. There's the... Uh, you can break that up into the traction load and the saltation load. So the saltation is the stuff that's bouncing. Traction is the stuff that's on the bottom that just kind of scoots along. There's the suspended load, which is all the lighter sediments that are uh, higher up in the water column, higher up in the, uh, the river. Uh, and so they're just kind of suspended flying around all over the place. They're not necessarily doing any erosion, but they're certainly being uh, transported. And then there's the dissolved load, which is the stuff that you can't see. So if we dissolve a piece of limestone, uh, we break apart its calcium, calcium carbonate. Remember CaCO3, that's what limestone is. It's made out of calcite. You can dissolve that. Those ions are still there. That calcium is still there. The carbon is still there. The oxygen is still there. And it's being uh, carried along in that stream. So you can't see it, but it's there. So we call that the dissolved load. And so if you have a heavy dissolve load in a stream and it goes out by the ocean, uh, things like clams and corals may really like that and say, ooh, look at all this calcium that's coming out this river. I'm going to use it and I'm going to grow. So what about deposition? There are different types of, of streams. Uh, there's the ones we see around here, which are mostly meandering streams. But if you dump enough sediment uh, into a stream, you can get um, braided streams, which you see a lot coming off of glaciers. Uh, you see a lot in Alaska. You see this closer to mountains where you just have tons and tons and tons of sediment coming down these streams. But uh, we can get bars, which are just chunks of sediment uh, being deposited along a stream somewhere. Uh, placer deposits, if you're into gold mining or interested in gold mining, uh, is where you find concentrations of heavy sediment. Gold is actually very heavy, uh, and so it's mined out of placer deposits. Braided streams, like I said, uh, they contain a lot of sediment. Uh, meandering streams uh, will have point bars like this, and they'll have point bars on the sides like we've been looking at. And we talked about floodplains before, but it's the edges of streams or on the outside of their channels. Then deltas, which are the very the end of a stream, which you'll get to, you'll get a lot of deposition uh, in deltas. Just look at Louisiana, and also alluvial fans. When we're in mountainous areas, uh, we don't really see this too much around Arkansas. You can kind of spot some areas that are sort of alluvial fans. Batesville, you could kind of argue, almost sort of sits on alluvial fan, uh, but we see it much better out west uh, around the Nevada area, the basin and range, where you have rivers that are coming out. Of, of mountains and it's a really steep stream it's a really steep river and all of a sudden boom it hits a flat area and that stream velocity slows down and pff, dumps all of its sediment so it's almost like a delta uh, of sediment coming out of the mountain so meandering streams like i said they flow faster along the outside they're slower on the inside so we get point bars on the inside and we get erosion on the outside uh, these things will evolve a meandering stream will move over time and I'll pull up uh, in class, we'll pull up Google Earth. Uh, this is something that happens not over geologic time. It happens faster than that. It happens fast enough that we really need to worry about it uh, as humans. Uh, I had a guy in my day job kind of come into our office and he really wanted to know if he could change the river. It was, uh, I think the middle fork of the right river. He wanted to go out there and, and kind of build back this, uh, this cut bank 
uh, on the on the outer edge to the cut banks like this part because it had just grown over the last decade or two it had just grown into his agricultural land and it ate away about I think it's about 10 acres which is a lot of land i mean if you think about how much 10 acres is uh going right around fayetteville if you kind of get out into the rural areas i think is about five to ten grand an acre so imagine losing a hundred thousand dollars worth of land over 10 years man that sucks and knowing about this stuff and how you can slow it down uh it can be very 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 valuable that guy messed up and that he he took out his trees he took out the vegetation along the edge of the river to let his cows get down there and let them graze more and then so the river just started to meander like crazy but we'll look at that in class uh, over time these meanders grow and rivers will kind of zigzag back and forth even more and more and more as they kind of evolve but eventually they will cut off that meander and you'll get something called an oxbow lake you don't see this too much up here in northwest Arkansas. However, there is a nice big one down near uh, Fort Smith. Uh, but you'll see this along the Mississippi River, all over the place. The Mississippi River does this all the time. Uh, and it's it's kind of neat. So there's a kind of just blown up meandering river. Again, depositing on these point bars and then eroding on the cut banks. And eventually you kind of get to the where it breaks that. That little levee and you you cut it off and so now there's no longer any flow here and now you've deposited on the side so you've got a separate little lake <clears throat> so flooding so floodplains they're broad strips of land on the outer sides of rivers and uh it's an area of deposition where you get a big flood it'll go on the outside of the natural levees of your channel uh, and you'll deposit a lot of, of clays and, and silts and things on these floodplains when you get heavy, heavy flooding. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you, if any of you remember the time of Katrina, this word, levees, was in the news a lot. Also, it was in the news a lot when we had our recent flooding here in 2019 along the Arkansas River, which had super historic flooding. It's flooded the most, I think, ever in, in uh, recent history. So perhaps even a couple hundred years back. Uh, but a river will kind of build up its own natural levees, and then it can pot potentially break them later on uh, by heavy flooding. So here's a picture of a river, similar to this one over here, where it's uh, it flooded and the water went out into the floodplains. <clears throat> this is something we'll look in class. So what about other deposition? So we have deltas. Uh, we've talked a little bit about deltas in class. I've mentioned them. So you get a big river uh, at the end of its course near the ocean, and it hits the ocean and it starts depositing. Uh, and what happens is it'll you'll slowly build up this delta over time, and the river will sort of uh, meander out to one side, deposit, 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 and then it'll break its its banks and move over to another area and deposit, deposit, deposit. So it breaks its banks again and then moves over and deposits, deposits, deposits. And so a river will just kind of migrate back and forth on a delta, depositing uh, in these areas. And different delta, there can be different looking deltas depending upon whether they're uh, wave dominated, tide dominated, or, or stream dominated. I'm not too concerned that you know the differences of, of these. There's something called a distributary, which is where it's kind of the opposite of a tributary, where a river will start to split off uh, once you get into a delta. <clears throat> uh i've covered alluvial fans before i don't think i need to do it again you should know what alluvial fan is by now so streams will do something called down cutting uh to where their base level is base level is talking about kind of the equilibrium of a stream or or a river uh because a river can be depositing or it can be eroding so if a river is eroding down and actually getting deeper into the rock. Uh, eventually, it gets down to a point where it's it's not so steep anymore, and so its slope is a little bit more gradual. And when you reach that point, it's kind of done done eroding. So it's not, you know, it doesn't have the velocity to really do any erosion. So it starts doing more deposition. Uh, but when you get down cutting, uh, it's when you are deepening a valley heavily. 
uh, due to erosion. <clears throat> and typically, we get V shaped valleys that form out of this, uh, and streams and rivers will basically stop once they've kind of reached that, that equilibrium, which is kind of that base level. Uh, you also get something called graded streams, uh, which is what this is over here. Uh, so a graded stream is where it's all nice and smoothed out and kind of has a nice equilibrium. Um, we've got a concave up longitudinal profile. Uh, they don't really have rapids or waterfalls. Uh, like I said, it's kind of an age thing and it's, it's reached that equilibrium. This is kind of the difference where it's not graded. You've got waterfalls, you've got rapids, you've got areas where the velocity slows down, you have areas where it speeds up just due to the, due to the change in slope. Uh, you also have lateral erosion, like is what we've been talking about with these meandering streams. They're eroding left and right, not just up and down, but left and right. And you have headward erosion, which is this the erosion of the back end of the valley where the streams start, right? So you can go back into a stream. You can see where a river starts or a stream starts. And there's still erosion happening at the back end of those streams just from natural uh, sources of weathering. So it's not just from the water moving. It's from things like frost wedging. So you remember that when we went through physical weathering. Uh, there's chemical weathering that may be happening back there, and you're kind of widening out uh, the back of these, these valleys over time slowly um, just due to, to weathering and erosion. <clears throat> you get something else called terraces, uh, and that's when you kind of have these major changes uh, with a river's kind of dynamic. Maybe you increase the sediment load. You... You increase the amount of water that's coming down it or you decrease it uh, and you can end up forming these terraces you can also like cause uplift so you have a, a continent that runs into another continent and now the, your whole river valley is kind of being lifted up a little bit uh, that can kind of cause terraces to happen um, something we don't see a whole heck of a lot around here in arkansas and when we do it's it's kind of hard to know that you're looking at it uh, but it's really prevalent and easy to see in areas that had a lot of uh, glacial action uh, during the last ice age. But here's a really good example down here in this picture. You can kind of see these benches up here. These are different terraces. <clears throat> so if you go out to uh, the western part of the U.S., you'll see these areas where you have crazy meandering going on in these rivers. We have these really deep valleys. And it's... You kind of wonder, is are these things still migrating? I mean, the river isn't, it's not depositing, you know, when it turns this way, it's not depositing these big old chunks. What's going on? Uh, and what happens with these is you start with a meandering stream and you cause uplift for some reason. You uplift the whole area. You're pushing up all the ground for some tectonic reason. And you'll get these incised meanders that just start eroding really quickly because they've got a really high velocity. And I'll get these really wild meandering rivers with these, these valleys. I think the, uh, there's, this may be the San Juan River, but the San Juan River is a really famous one out west that, that kind of has these, these features. <clears throat> um, flooding's bad. Uh, we're really concerned because it does a lot of damage. It can kill people. You know, you pay a lot of taxes and a lot of tax dollars sometimes end up going into uh, repairing flooded flooded areas. Uh, floods will happen when you have a lot of really high velocity water moving into an area. It can take out bridges. Uh, it can cause a lot of deaths. Uh, I grew up in Austin, Texas, which had a big problem with flash flooding, which means a little bit of rain would cause a lot of flooding really, really quickly. And people would try to drive across the road where water was moving and their cars would get washed away and they drown and it was bad. Um, something that causes flash flooding, uh, this is something I want you guys to know about because it's something that gets talked about in the news around, around here in uh, Northwest Arkansas, which is developing really quickly. Uh, in fact, I'm, at, yeah, I'm even having this own problem in my own house. Uh, because across the street from me, they're, they're building a couple of brand new houses and they put in a new new road. But uh, runoff of water can be sped up, right? So normally if rain hits ground, uh, hits the ground outside in a field or something, it kind of hits the grass or there's soil there that kind of absorbs it. 
and it takes a while to kind of run off the field, but that field can kind of absorb uh, a lot of water. So normally, uh, if we kind of graph this, we get a bunch of rainfall, right? So a whole bunch of rainfall, and then we have a river, and it's got a discharge. Well, slowly it's it's increasing its discharge, so that river is getting higher and higher and higher. There's more water in it, and then it ends up dumping all its water, and it gets done with. However, around that river, if we get into its drainage basin, right, if we go to the areas around that river and let's pave it all over, we, we pave over all the fields and now it's all asphalt and concrete. You can imagine that when the water hits the concrete and asphalt, it runs off really quick. And so that river floods even more. It gets even worse. And then it will subside over time. But you end up getting higher levels in that river, you get higher velocities. So that river that once maybe didn't do so much damage or no damage at all can now is now capable of doing a whole lot of damage because you've put in a nearby neighborhood <clears throat> the example i'm having with this is uh my yard is kind of a spot there's a spot in my yard where i have my septic system uh and it's you know if i get an inch of rain i'll get a little bit of water that collects over my septic system and it'll eventually run off and it's not a big deal however across the street they've put in a new road and normally the water from the fields across the street flows into a ditch. But now it runs down the street and runs across the road and into my yard. So I've got increased runoff now. I've got increased flooding. And what used to, you know, one inch of rain puts one inch of rain on my yard. Now I get, if it rains one inch, I get the equivalent of like five inches of rain on my yard because I'm taking on a couple of acres of more water. Uh, and I'm getting increased flooding in my yard. Uh, and so now I'm trying to get some help either by the city to, to help remedy this, or I'm gonna to have to sue my neighbor. So this is something that happens a lot in Northwest Arkansas where areas are developing more and people are concerned because if you live by a stream <clears throat> uh, that didn't used to flood when we got heavy rains and upstream they build another subdivision, now all of a sudden your house may flood. How can we reduce flood risk? Well, one way we do it is we will dam up rivers and we can kind of control them with reservoirs, right? So if you put a big old dam at one end of the river, you create a reservoir uh, that can hold a lot of water. You can sort of slowly release however much water you need so you don't flood the city downstream. This happened when we had the major uh, flooding this past summer on the Arkansas River is the, the, a lot of the rainfall wasn't really here in Arkansas. It was up in Oklahoma farther upstream and they tried to hold back a lot of that water in the reservoirs in the lakes they have in Oklahoma before letting it out down in the rest of the Arkansas River so it was kind of controlled a little bit it could have been worse than it actually was and it was pretty bad as it is <clears throat> but basically those those dams held back as much water as they could then they had to release it we can also create artificial levees as opposed to nat natural levees where we can you know concrete in these rivers and keep them from from overturning their their banks uh, and we can also do you know wise use or, or wise land use planning and do stuff like what i was talking about be careful with where you develop uh different areas um to make sure you don't increase runoff too much or you can build something that's called a rain garden if you google rain garden basically you can kind of turn your yard into an area that can absorb a lot of water naturally and kind of help uh with runoff and it's a pretty neat thing. There's actually grants out there you can apply for. People will give you free money. They'll be like, hey, yeah, here's $1,000. Uh, build a rain garden. We'll help you do it. And it's in areas that are prone to flooding that need, need help. <clears throat> so, big scary graph. Uh, before you look at that, just listen to me. So you may have heard of something called like a 100-year flood or a 500-year flood. The The... The flooding we had on the Arkansas River this past July of uh, 2019 was considered a 500-year flood. Now, most people think that that means that it happens every 500 years. And that's, that's not really true. It's more based on a probability uh, of chance. So you can have a 500-year flood one year, and next year you can also have another 500-year flood, or a 1,000-year flood, or a 100-year flood. It's kind of based on the probability, and this is the graph that kind of shows how that uh, how that works. 
<clears throat> and a 500 year flood, or let's say a 100 year flood, uh, is basically stating you have a 1% chance of any year of a river getting to a certain level or having a certain amount of discharge, a certain amount of water going through it. <clears throat> and so kind of here, here that is gra uh, dra graphed out. All these points kind of represent uh, points where a river was measured and how much discharge it has. So over here on the, uh, the, the <laughs> this axis, we've got discharge in water in cubic feet per second. Uh, you may be more familiar with measurements of water like gallons or liters. So you can almost think of this as like gallons per second or liters per second. Uh, but cubic, a cubic foot is bigger than a gallon. But this is cubic feet per second going through that river. So down here, the river is just, you know, it's not very high. It's kind of doing its normal thing. But let's say we kick it up to 200 cubic feet per second. Well, over here, that seems to happen uh, about once every one and a quarter years. So every 1.25 years, uh, this river will reach about 200 cubic feet per second. If we kick it up to 1,000 feet per second, I can follow it over here. And it looks like this river hits about 1,000 feet per second, about on average every 3.33 years. And you have a probability of, I don't know, what is that? About 30% chance of this happening on any given, given year. So we can take this all the way up the graph, and we get to these points right here. So if you were to ever, if this river, wherever this, this is measuring some river or some stream, if it were to ever get to a point where it, it had 8,000 cubic feet per second flowing through it, that would be the equivalent of about a thousand year flood. Or a uh, 0.1% chance of happening. So th these are actually, this is not in percent. You'd multiply these numbers by 100 to get them in percent. So this is like 98%, 80%, 50%, 20%, 10%, 5%, 2%. No, sorry. 10%, 5%, 2%. Oh, yeah, 1%. So my bad. This is a 100-year flood, not a 1,000. <clears throat> so this is the equivalent of being about a 100-year flood or a 1% chance of it happening. So any given year, that river, 1% chance. With this happening that if it floods once that year the next year it could do it again it doesn't mean it happens every hundred years that's kind of the misnomer is people think like oh well last year we had a 500 year flood we're not going to have one this year that's not true you could just as likely have one that year but uh these are called flood frequency uh curves or or graphs and you can kind of look these up for any given given river and other times you can find other information, like you might find uh, depth over here on this axis where they'll plot out the actual depth uh, of the river. And you can find rivers that are near you and try to figure out, okay, I live close to this stream or close to this river. What are the chances it's actually going to flood my house? I did this for one of my friends who's got a new house in Fayetteville, and they're kind of developed in that area. And I kind of told him, like, dude, you probably don't want to live there forever because if you live there for 20 years, sometime in that 20-year time span, there's a good chance you're going to have water coming up into your living room especially if they keep developing neighborhoods around your area. <clears throat> so speaking of the Arkansas uh, River, this is the Arkansas River when it flooded. This is the whole area. So you can kind of see in here that lighter blue. That's where it normally is. Uh, but when it overturned, its, this is all of Fort Smith right here. Uh, but when it overturned its banks, that's how much area was flooded. That's how, many, how much of the farm fields and the towns. And it was a, a major, major event. Uh, another little fun thing right here, you see this? <clears throat> this is an oxbow lake. So this used to be a part of a, a meander in the Arkansas River. But it got cut off. And you can see remnants of old meanders uh, over here. Kind of neat. Uh, this is a video I will have you watch. And that's it for that chapter. Uh, be sure you do the quiz. Uh, I believe I've combined the quizzes for chapter 10 and chapter 11. So after this, uh, go and look at chapter 11 and then uh, take the quiz.